little uppity, don't you think? <laughs> so, glad he's here, one way or the other. Today's hearing's hybrid, our witnesses are in person, but members have the option to either appear in person or virtually. Last year marked one year, I mean, I'm sorry, last week marked one year since Vladimir Putin unleashed his brutal criminal war on Ukraine. Putin wanted to jeopardize the future of sovereign democracy and in the process to threaten the world order, all order an order based on freedom and democracy and the rule of law. Putin has been surprised by two things, the resilience of the, America, of the Ukrainian people and President Biden's ability to put together and keep together a broad, consistent international coalition to support the Ukrainian people as they defend their country. Last week, I again met with Ukrainian Americans in Greater Cleveland, one of the most vibrant, largest Ukrainian communities in the country. In our country, my state is proud to have that vibrant, active community. Ohioans' message to me was clear. We maintain our resolve. We must continue to hold the Russian government accountable, along with all those who enable its war on Ukraine. We can't waver in our commitment to Ukraine. I'm glad that President Biden and Senator Schumer and Leader McConnell all made, their, all made clear their support last week. Many of our colleagues of both parties were overseas last week, all showing united bipartisan support. Our commitment to the Ukrainian people, our resolve to stand up to Putin has never been partisan. We must recognize that Putin's brutal war is the most recent assault that authoritarians are launching around the world. All their eyes are on our response in Eastern Europe right now. NATO General Secretary said last month, if President Putin wins in Ukraine, this would send a message that authoritarian regimes can achieve their goals by brute force. Beijing is watching closely and learning lessons that may influence its future decisions. It's what the administration's national security strategy outlined as, quote, a strategic competition to shape the future of the international order, unquote. Today's hearing is about how we use economic tools, sanctions, export controls, investment screening to advance and protect U.S. national security and foreign policy. In addition to the humanitarian and military assistance the U.S. and our allies have provided to Ukraine, our response to Putin's war centered on the significant sanctions and export controls we have, uh, we have imposed to ensure that, that, that Russia, not the rest of the world, bear, bears the full cost of Putin's illegal criminal invasion. These measures are imposing real costs on Russia. Treasury Dep Deputy Secretary Wally Adeyemo put it pretty well last week, our actions are forcing Russia to mortgage its economic future to save face today. We, of course, recognize that not all economies are the same. Our work is complex as we confront the challenges posed by President Xi and the Chinese Communist Party in Beijing. 25 years ago, uh, Senator Lindsey Graham and I led efforts as House members to oppose China's accession to the World Trade Organizations. Organization corporations in search of ever-growing profits shut down manufacturing in Ohio and in South Carolina and across the U.S. and moved production to China. It contributed to the industrialization of China, and it's funded the buildup, direct link, it's funded the buildup of the Chinese military. I've challenged that failed China policy of administrations of both parties, presidents in both parties, all the way from the first Bush up through Trump, presidents of both parties, um, have failed us on, on China in that way. It was obvious to some of us then, what all of us see now, that China poses a real threat to our economic security. Look at Columbiana County in Ohio, the home of East Palestine. Uh, look at Clarendon County in South Carolina. Now the serious national security threats are also obvious. The Chinese government made its aims clear to dominate advanced technology and global supply chains. The Chinese Communist Party's civil military fusion policy erases the line separating commercial and military use of finished goods and of the technologies that go into them. And we've seen Beijing ramp, ramp up its activities in the South China Sea and Taiwan Strait while, oppress, while oppressing its own citizens. Now we're even seeing Chinese Communist Party officials meeting with Putin and consistently refusing to condemn his invasion of Ukraine. Whether in Beijing or Moscow, whether in Iran or North Korea, whether it's to address IP theft, human rights abusers, foreign traffickers of illicit fentanyl. We need a robust economic policy to deter and disrupt behavior that hurts U.S. national security interests. In this committee, 
I've worked with colleagues in both parties to restrict U.S. technology or financing from being used in ways that harm U.S. national security interests. On a bipartisan basis, this committee led reforms to strengthen our investment screening process conducted by, by CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. We provided government per permanent statutory authority for the Bureau of Industry and Security, the BIS, to administer and enforce our export control system. And last Congress, Ranking Member Toomey and I led this committee's work to prohibit the importation of Russia gold, to impose sanctions regarding human rights abuses by Iran, and to expand BIS's authority to limit exports to foreign militaries, uh, in intelligence services and security forces. We took action last year, many, many sitting at this table re remember, to remove most favored nation trade status from Russia. Actions have economic consequences. I hope we'll continue this strong history of bipartisan work on important national and economic security issues in this committee's jurisdiction over the next two years with Ranking Member Scott, I'm confident we will. Today in this hearing, we have a chance to take that first step by examining how we use our economic toolkit to advance the breadth of issues that impact our U.S. national security and foreign policy. We must use these tools we have to deter or disrupt behavior that undermines our economy. We need to do that while we strengthen our partnership with countries that share our values for democracy and free markets. We, must need, we need to do that while not harming U.S. economic and technological leadership. Senator Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I start with my comments, I just want to acknowledge the uh, challenges and the tragedy in East Palestine, Ohio, that you and both Senator Vance represent. My prayers are shortly with the folks there and hope that we continue to see a all of government approach to solving the problems and certainly holding those folks accountable as well. Thank you for saying that. <clears throat> yes, sir. Last year marked the one year anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Over this past year, we've seen the horrors of war and brutal loss of life, but we've also seen the strength of the Ukrainian people. Their fight against tyranny and oppression to seek and maintain their independence is inspiring and reminds me of our own intrinsic values that inform American patriotism, the hope for a better future. We are fortunate enough to live in the greatest nation on earth and must always be vigilant to protect and promote national and economic security, the underpinnings of our nation. Preserving our status as a world leader requires the continual honing and sharpening of our economic security tools in order to preserve and protect the role of America at home and abroad. These tools are often pushed beyond our everyday conversations. Folks don't always bring up sanctions at the dinner table, at least not in my house. But they are important to protecting and promoting American interests. We've seen firsthand, whether it's with Russia or North Korea, that the tailored use of sanctions can be an effective foreign policy and economic security apparatus. Unfortunately, these same tools have been wielded as hammers instead of scalpels, resulting in pushing our adversaries toward closer cooperation with each other and further away from us. Much like the Obama administration's famous red line, the Biden administration's failure to enforce existing sanctions manifests weakness which is an unacceptable abuse of our nation's global leadership and signals to friend and foe alike that when we are saying something, we may not actually mean it. Recent reports of Chinese and Iranian support for Russian weaponry flouting U.S. sanctions is just another example. If there was ever a time to kowtow to our adversaries and their supporters, I assure you, it is not today, nor ever. National security efforts should support, not detract, from American industrial leadership, a common sense principle. However, instead of using American oil and natural gas resources to aid our European allies and their efforts to cut ties with Russian oil, the Biden administration restricted American energy production to promote liberal climate change policies, punishing not only our allies, but everyday families stuck with higher and higher energy bills. When looking at tools like export controls and our investment security review process, our goal should be a holistic one that combats malign economic aggression. Specifically, the Chinese Communist Party has enacted laws facilitating the theft and unfair treatment of American innovation. We must use our export controls to ensure sensitive technologies are not being shared with foreign adversaries, 
much like we must use the CFIUS process to ensure bad actors are not granted undue access under the guise of benign foreign investment. Economic security requires precision and strength. We must champion American economic opportunity. Hard work and ingenuity are two of the main drivers of the American dream, the same dream that our adversaries are working to stop. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses and this is on this important topic. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Scott, and thank you for your comments about East Palestine. I was there again yesterday. Excellent. Um, and I appreciate the work that Senator Vance has done there, and Congress, the local congressman, yes. Bill Johnson, has been there um, at least a couple times a week and Indeed. has really stepped up, so thank you. Yes, sir. I'll uh, introduce today's witnesses. Uh, Dalip Singh is the former Deputy National Security Advisor for National Economics at the National Security Council and former Deputy Director of the National Economic Council. Welcome. Uh, Clay Lowry served as Assistant Secretary of International Affairs at the U.S. Department of Treasury. Mr. Lowry, welcome. And Kevin Wolf served from 2010 to 2017 as the Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Export Administration at BIS at the U.S. Department of Commerce. Uh, welcome to you, Mr. Wolf. I will now begin Mr. Singh's testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Scott, distinguished members for inviting me to testify, which I'm doing so today in my personal capacity. I'll make three points on the Russia sanctions program, goals, impact, and lessons learned. First on goals, sanctions serve a geopolitical purpose. Before February 24 of last year, that purpose was to help preserve the peace. How? By signaling to Putin our readiness to impose the most severe economic sanctions ever deployed if he invaded. Of course, the rest is history. Once the invasion began, the objective of sanctions evolved. Short term, maximize the costs on Putin for continuing the war. Medium term, degrade Putin's ability to exert influence and project power on the world stage. Long term, generate a negative demonstration for any autocrat that might consider redrawing borders by force. In pursuing these objectives, we unleash the arsenal of sanctions we warned Putin about, itself the product of intense collaboration with nearly 40 countries. Our shared mindset was to attack pressure points where our collective strengths intersect with Russia's vulnerabilities. Five channels stood out. Channel one was the delivery of a capital account shock. Together with more than half the world's economy, we denied capital to and blocked any transactions with the largest Russian banks. To Putin's surprise, we then immobilized almost half of his central bank's foreign reserves, disarming the financial fortress he'd built for this war. Channel two was the denial of cutting edge technology to Putin. Semiconductors, AI, quantum, robotics, biotech, these are the foundational technologies for every modern economy and military. Denying these inputs meant we could degrade Putin's war machine in Ukraine and anywhere else for generations to come. Channel three was the removal of Russia's privileges in the global economy, its ability to receive a bailout from the IMF or the World Bank, its most favored nation trading status thanks to this committee, its reputation as an investment grade borrower. Channel four was the downgrade of Russia's position as a leading energy supplier by shutting down his prized Nord Stream 2 pipeline, by banning our imports of Russian energy, by undercutting his revenues with a novel oil price cap, and by speeding our transition to renewables. Channel 5 was our launch of a global campaign to expose and hold to account Russia's kleptocrats. The Russian people have been getting ripped off by Putin and his cronies for a long time, and they deserve to see it for themselves. In terms of impact, I would say sanctions are doing their job. First, Russia's economy is contracting, and for years to come, it, its growth prospects are bleak. It's true that last year's recession is smaller than expected, but don't mistake this for resilience. To limit the depth of the current recession, Putin sacrificed Russia's economic potential with capital controls, by weaponizing energy, and depleting his national savings. But let's be clear, the exit of more than 1,000 multinational companies will bite. So will the flight of up to a million of Russia's best and brightest. So will the loss of leading edge technology. So will the loss of half of his customer base for energy. So will default. The Russian government itself expects that GDP will bottom 8 to 12% lower than its 2021 baseline, equivalent to almost $200 billion in lost income. Second, the crippling effects of our export controls on Russia's military industrial complex are both profound and underappreciated. I've given you a sampling of these impacts in my written testimony, but the bottom line is that without leading edge technology, We've put the Russian military at a disadvantage on the battlefield and denied Putin's ambition to project power on the world stage. Third, Russia's dominant role in global energy markets will never be the same. Our strategy to minimize Putin's energy revenues while protecting households at the gas pump is working. 
Russia's oil and gas revenues were down almost 50% from last year as of January. Here at home, prices at the pump are 15 cents a gallon lower than when the invasion began. Overseas, European gas and electricity prices have fully retraced. As a caveat, let me repeat that sanctions are just one of many tools. They work when they're embedded in a broader strategy. Most importantly, doing all we can to support Ukraine's fight for freedom, fortifying NATO's eastern flank, doing all we can to help the world deal with the spillovers of Putin's war, and working to finance Ukraine's future as a successful alternative to Russian kleptocracy. Executing on all these fronts and staying the course is what will create leverage for Ukraine if and when it chooses a diplomatic settlement. Reflecting on lessons learned, I'm enormously proud of the unity we forged with Europe, the G7, and beyond within hours of the invasion to move in lockstep with unprecedented force. But I have to admit, many more countries have stood aside and sounded caution about sanctions. So in my judgment, we need to take four actions to win the global narrative and prepare for what's ahead. First, we should articulate a doctrine of economic statecraft at the highest levels of government. We've spent hundreds of years crafting military doctrine, only a tiny fraction of that time doing so for economic statecraft. Second, we should continue building an analytical infrastructure that takes economic statecraft seriously. Third, we should stress test the tools of economic statecraft against conflict scenarios. And lastly, we need balance. Sanctions receive enormous attention as a coercive device. If you don't change behavior, it will cause you pain. But this message rarely wins hearts and minds. So it's on us to balance the increased use of sanctions, which are designed to cause pain, with an even greater emphasis on statecraft that offers mutual economic gain, our true competitive advantage. Infrastructure finance, supply chain partnerships, technology alliances, debt relief, revitalizing the World Bank can all serve this purpose, and in doing so, demonstrate the incomparable promise of American economic strength as a force for global good. Thank you. Mr. Lowry, welcome. Uh, Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Scott, and members of the committee, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to testify. As requested by the committee, I will discuss briefly the economic impact uh, on Russia due to the sanctions regime put in place in 2022. Um, try not to re repeat what uh, Mr. Singh said. Two is some of the lessons that can be drawn when you're thinking about China. And three, in a, a little bit different, the idea of an outward bound investment screening mechanism using the prism of CFIUS to uh, judge it. The United States, along with a number of allies, imposed arguably the most robust financial sanctions package in history. A year later, this has had a substantial economic and financial impact. But it has neither been as dramatic nor as sweeping as was estimated last year. Although the sanctions regime was expansive, there were still major carve-outs for natural gas, oil, petroleum products. The exports of these products enabled Russia's current account surplus to nearly double in 2022, which means an extra $100 billion, which helped Russia pro provide much needed liquidity to their economy and revenue to prop up their fiscal position. Second, while the Biden administration quickly and successfully put together a, a, a significant multilateral co coalition for sanctions, this coordination, in some respects, has not been broad enough, and let me just provide an example. Russian oil export volumes fell across the EU, Japan, Korea, and several other countries, yet Russian oil export volumes overall were still up in 2022, as countries such as China, India, and Turkey increased their purchases. And finally, Russia also adapted to the sanctions. The Central Bank of Russia, for instance, took swift and decisive measures that allowed the exchange rate and the banking system to stabilize. Now, Russia's economic and financial resilience in the face of such a major sanctions program does not mean that the program was a failure. In fact, it seems to be having an impact, as Mr. Singh said, on Russia's ability to obtain war fighting materials, has led to a brain drain, and is likely to lead to a slow but steady decrease in both productivity and economic activity for years to come. So you've asked me to consider how such a sanctions program would look like in the case of China. The key difference, of course, between China and Russia is China's economy and overall engagement in the world economy is simply magnitudes bigger than Russia in both scope and in scale. And to an extent, we would really be comparing an apple to an orange. However, there may be three insights from Russia as they relate to China that are worth thinking about. First is China, like Russia, has a significant current account surplus. But instead of being a major commodity exporter, they are the top exporter of manufactured goods. 
In fact, China's share of global manufactured exports are more than twice the share of what Russia's share of energy and fuel exports. Second, international coordination may be more difficult as it relates to China. China's much broader and deeper engagement in the international economic system suggests that choosing to implement sanctions, frankly, will be a much more difficult decision for jurisdictions around the world. And third, there is implementation risk. Even if international coordination is high, sanctions regimes are, are quite complex, and executing on them and implementing them is not like flipping a switch. And China will be even more complex than Russia. So the bottom line is that sanctions regimes are difficult to implement. Multilateral cooperation is quite complicated, particularly for larger economies. You can't plug every leak, and countries adapt. Now, let me switch to thinking about outward bound investment and its relationship to CFIUS. So one of the tools that the administration and Congress has been considering to influence our economic relationship with China is an outward bound investment screening mechanism, and some have referred to it as a reverse CFIUS. As an individual who oversaw CFIUS, let me use it, let me try to think about what the key lessons from CFIUS are that could be applied. The first is understanding the objective of CFIUS. It is to ensure national security while promoting foreign investment. It's not a balance, it's both. To me, this means you have to minimize the opportunity for politicizing transactions, you have to keep CFIUS narrowly focused on national security, and you need to ensure accountability of the executive branch. The lessons that I think can further be drawn for trying to come up with legislation or executive branch action on an outward bound investment are Avoid the temptation to use vague and ill-defined terms. Don't duplicate existing authorities. Understand that there's a resource burden on the executive branch that makes implementation difficult. And realize that placing such government controls on private sector transactions, particularly in cases that have nothing to do with national security, is likely to harm our competitiveness and may prove to be counterproductive to our national security. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today, and I'd be pleased to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Lauer. Mr. Wolf, you're recognized. Thank you for being here. Um, Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Scott, other members of the committee, thank you for asking me back. Uh, the views I expressed today are my own. Um, as requested, I'm providing a description of export control policy in historical context with recommendations for how to make export controls, particularly with respect to China and Russia, more effective and less counterproductive. Um, to level set, unlike sanctions, export controls are the rules that govern um, the export, re-export, and transfer of commodities, software, technology, and occasionally services to specific destinations, end uses, and end users to accomplish various national security or foreign policy objectives. Um, my prepared remarks set out a lot more detail, but really the current discussion that's taking place is um, what is the contemporary national security objective uh, to be achieved um, with respect to a system that was originally created uh, to be focused on identifying items for use in producing or developing weapons of mass destruction uh, or uh, conventional weapons. And, and the post-Cold War era system, the system created in the 1990s that largely governs the laws of our allies and is um, the foundation for the U.S. system, although the U.S. system is broader, means that the allied export control systems uh, don't have generally the legal authorities or the cultures to address contemporary national security issues such as strategic uh, competition concerns, military civil fusion policies, uh, human rights abuses in particular involving commercial technologies, supply chain security, and uh, the need to promote democracy over authoritarianism. And the rise of the military civil fusion policies that you refer to is particularly significant because this classical dual use system uh, was created on the premise that one could tell the distinction uh, between an item for civil and military applications. And so to address these issues, I put together and described a series of recommendations. And the first is to, for the committee and the Congress to support the administration efforts to work with allies to develop and articulate together a significantly expanded vision for export controls to address these contemporary common strategic national security and human rights objectives uh, that are outside the scopes of the post-Cold War era uh, multilateral export regimes. And second, to ensure that um, uh, this vision can be implemented and updated domestic regulations of our allies um, uh, to work 
with the administration to create a new multilateral export control regime, again, with two mandates to address classical export control issues that can't be addressed by the current regimes, given Russia's ability to veto any progress uh, in the regimes. And then the second mandate would be to address these items that are of contemporary strategic um, uh, security issues, particularly with respect to uh, China and Russia. Um, third, uh, to work with the allies um, uh, to create and announce standards for the legal authorities that each of the allied governments uh, should have in their export control systems in order to implement either a new regime or short-term plurilateral arrangements to address um, non-classical export control issues. Um, and then also the Congress should work with or require and support the administration efforts uh, uh, to work with the allies in order to develop with their legislatures and executive branches uh, the legal authorities and the funding for their export control agencies to be able to have these authorities and to work with the U.S. Uh, fifth, to echo in a regular and a bipartisan way uh, that this new vision for export control thinking uh, about strategic controls um, uh, is in the common security interests of, of each of the allies and to overcome what is a quite significant skepticism among the allies, make it clear on a regular basis that this is not an effort, um, as a, a mercantilistic effort by the U.S. to promote economic advantage of U.S. companies over companies in allied countries. Um, and as an incentive for participation to uh, create incentive, incentives and benefits for allies to cooperate with this new vision for export controls, uh, particularly in the form of the reduction of unnecessary trade barriers um, uh, caused by export controls as a result of history by and among and between the close allies. Uh, with respect to the enforcement side, um, to significantly enhance the administration's efforts and the allied country efforts uh, to data mine, to conduct investigations, to work together, and to coordinate on, on global enforcement efforts. Um, uh, as seventh, as part of the AUKUS initiative, uh, Congress should support administration efforts to radically harmonize and simplify uh, the defense trade and dual use rules by and among between close allies, Australia, uh, the UK, uh, Canada, the United States, of course. And, and um, all of these recommendations and others that I listed are going to be really quite hard. <laughs> I admit that, but success will require inspired and inspirational and long-term and fact-based and bipartisan leadership. Uh, so all other alternatives are worse. <laughs> uh, so with that, I will uh, stop and answer any questions you might have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wolf. Uh, start with Mr. Singh. Uh, the world watched with horror as Putin initiated an illegitimate war against the criminal war against the people of Ukraine. I know that Ukrainian Americans in my home state support the U.S. and the global coalition imposing sweeping, sweeping sanctions and export <coughs> controls, excuse me, in response to the invasion. Describe the effectiveness, if you would, Mr. Singh, of our response and what metrics we should look at, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, when determining whether sanctions, thank you, and other economic measures are having an impact. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for those sentiments as well. So let's start with the facts. Uh, Russia is in recession. It was growing at 4.7% in 2021, the year before the invasion. Last year, it contracted 2.2%. That's a fairly sizable swing. Now, it's true, the depth of the recession is not as large as many expected, including me. But I would not mistake this for resilience. It's not strength. It's more like a Potemkin facade. What Putin has done is prop up the current growth uh, of the economy in exchange for sacrificing long-run growth potential. And there are three ways in which he did that. First, he slapped on capital controls. If you have capital controls, that means if you have rubles, you can't sell them for dollars. That arrested the free fall of the ruble, but it meant that it, it was much more difficult for Russia to actually import. Imports are priced in dollars, and that's led to a depletion of the goods Russia needs to modernize its economy, to diversify its economy. Second, he weaponized energy. And that, of course, spiked energy prices worldwide. It flattered his trade surplus. It lifted GDP growth, but at the cost of losing half of his customer base, the G7. And it led to a price cap, which will crimp his revenues even outside the G7. The latest budget figures in Russia showed a 46% decline in oil and gas revenues in January relative to last year. The third thing it is, he spiked government spending by 60% as of the last month. Of course, much of that money went into the war machine, and that lifted GDP growth, but at the cost of hundreds of thousands of Russian lives that have been lost, to say nothing, of course, of the lives that have been lost in Ukraine. Uh, it also depleted his national savings. It pushed up inflation and interest rates. 
So look, the, the Russian government's own analysis shows that its economy will bottom 8 to 12% lower than in 2021. And I actually think that's an aggressive estimate. He's lost 1,000 multinational companies. He's lost a million of his best and brightest. He's lost his technology base. He's lost his access to capital markets, and he's in default. That's the end game for Putin. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Wolf, uh, that, that was the you know, all positive response about what, what um, export controls and sanctions have done. Uh, take the other side a little bit. Describe the limitations of current export control regimes and how the global response to the invasion of Ukraine has presented both the necessity and opportunity for a new multilateral export control regime. Oh, terrific, thank you. Um, as I mentioned, the current export control system of our allies was established in the 1990s uh, to focus on items of direct relevance to producing or developing or using weapons of mass destruction or conventional weapons. And so it does not address uh, any of the contemporary national security issues that have been mentioned earlier, including the strategic uh, security issues, uh, human rights objectives, uh, and country-specific issues, uh, or the civil military fusion policies that you mentioned in your introduction. Also, um, uh, the way the regimes work is that each member has a veto over any change or progress, and Russia is a member of three of the four regimes and is apparently vetoing significant progress. And so as a structural matter to enhance the effectiveness of the controls and to reduce counterproductive impacts on US industry to level the playing field, I've been advocating for the creation of a new regime to address both of those mandates and for the US to uh, lead that effort to create it. I've got much longer versions of the description in my testimony, but that's the essential answer. Thank you. Um, back to you again, Mr. Singh. Given the economies of, of Russia and China are very different, you talked about commodities versus manufacturing as sort of the, the trademark, if that's the right word, of each, uh, and have different levels of interconnected with connectedness with the U.S. and our allies. What lessons may be learned from the Russia response that would be helpful in understanding the challenges and using our economic uh, toolkit with China. So first on the differences, you're right. I mean, and, and Mr. Lowry alluded to this, China's economy is 10 times larger than that of Russia. Its banking sector is 30 times larger than that of Russia. It's the largest manufactured goods exporter in the world by a very large margin. It has a dominant position in many different critical supply chains, solar panels, EV batteries, machine tools, 5G, even parts of the semiconductor supply chain like assembly and packaging. Uh, it also has nearly a peer status with us on, on foundational technologies like AI, biotech, and even quantum. Uh, and then lastly, it's accumulated a lot of soft power since the Belt Road Initiative was initiated in 2013. It's the largest lender to developing countries, uh, two times as much as all other Western governments combined, and much more than the World Bank. Now, uh, how, do we, how do we confront those circumstances? Well, I think, you know, uh, drawing from the lesson of Russia, we have to start with objectives and strategy. What is the objective? Is it deterrence? Is it to degrade uh, the target's ability to project power and exert influence? Is it to maximize costs? Uh, is it a demonstration effect? Is it to fire a warning shot? Depending on the objective and the strategy, we can then have, I think, a, an, an analysis-driven understanding of how our strengths intersect with the target's vulnerabilities. And it's from that point that you choose tools. Some of these will be negative coercive devices like sanctions, export controls, tariffs, any delistings. Others can be positive inducements to win the narrative with countries that would have to join a coalition. And that that's what I was making reference to in terms of infrastructure finance and debt relief and bilateral assistance and using the institutions we built like the World Bank and the IMF uh, to build a coalition that could make a difference. Thank you. Uh, uh, Ranking Member Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. During implementation of our sanctions on Russia, many experts predicted a collapse of the Russian economy, turning the clock back to the 1980s Soviet Russia. However, it now appears that Russia has been able to work to mask the full impact of sanctions by spending against their future spending now. Putin has decided that well, his life is more valuable than the lives of Russia's children and its future. His business as usual, there and the IMF is even predicting the Russian economy will grow next year. If this prediction holds true, that's troubling to me. It's like driving with your check engine light on. The car keeps going, but you know sooner or later it's going to be on the side of the road. To no one's surprise, Russian oil revenues 
are the one thing keeping their war machine going. Ms. Lowry, could you describe how the Russian economy is currently functioning and what impact you would expect if the U.S. sought more expansive sanctions on Russian energy? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Senator Scott. Um, so um, I agree with both you and Mr. Singh that the, um, it's, this is not necessarily purely about Russian resilience. It's also about Russia basically changing you know, selling its future for the here and now. But of course, the here and now is what we're dealing with now. And you're, you're correct. The IMF basically is predicting a flat, maybe slight growth in Russia's economy next year. There are others out there that predict a slight decline, but whatever it is, it's not that dramatic. Now, um, uh, Mr. Singh made a really valuable point, which was that we have seen a fall off in oil revenue um, over the last few months. So while uh, the summer and the early fall for Russia was actually dramatically positive from a revenue perspective, it has fallen off. This could start having more of an impact on the overall economy than even the IMF has predicted. Now, could there be more that is done? I think the answer is yes, but it is all, and again, it's difficult, right? So the areas that it seems like we could do a bit more, and we're starting to see it, Europe has now put in place essentially an embargo on Russian oil and Russian petroleum products, not natural gas. The, um, uh, the G7 has tried to put in a price cap on those very same uh, products. Um, we're trying to figure out whether how well that will work. It's still kind of the ju jury is still out on that. Um, the key area is, can we get more countries to join in? And that, as we've seen, has been very complicated. Um, and also, could we do more on uh, natural gas area, which again, is a, ni is a nice revenue provider for Russia. So those are some, some areas in the petroleum area. There are other areas that we could probably discuss, but that, that uh, hopefully answers your question. It does, Mr. Lauer. Another question on the same topic of, from an energy perspective. Would you imagine that if America started increasing its exports of energy because we increased our energy production, that would also give us another tool in the toolkit as it relates to, I mean, you just described really a blanket going over much of Russia's production, yeah. and yet we, start, we still see our allies struggling in Europe. If we had more production, would we have a, a stronger toolkit? Yes. I mean, I, I don't think there can be any doubt about that. Um, I like asking questions. I think I know the answer to on this one. <laughs> <laughs> you told uh, something different, I'd be really surprised. Yeah, that. no. Uh, no, I think that, um, look, the United States is a energy provider and an yes. exporter. And um, uh, one, of the in, one of the most fascinating parts uh, we've seen, I, I mentioned Russia's adjustments. It's also the adaptability of some of our allies. Germany was not able to take in natural gas from a number of countries except for Russia. They have put in a massive investment to try to, uh, to change that so that they can diversify where they get their natural gas, whether it is from Qatar, Norway, or the United States. And so I think that, um, so I think that boosting our ability to export in those areas seems like something that could be helpful to our allies as well as obviously to our own economy. Well, I only have 25 seconds left, so I'll save my, my question for the next round to Mr. Singh. But I will say that when I was on the Energy Committee back in 2014, 2015, one of the things I saw was the uh, from Lithuania, their minister came over and said, please, please, please start exporting LNG. And we were just silent on that, that decision. And previous decisions continue to have a domino effect on our ability to be in a stronger position from a global perspective when you need it the most. Thanks, Senator Scott. Senator Menendez is recognized from New Jersey. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this hearing on the question of sanctions. So uh, I see that China continues to buy millions of barrels uh, of oil from Russia, uh, but we don't seem to sanction them. Uh, I see that uh, Turkey uh, is involved, according to Bloomberg, between March and October of last year, Turkish exporters sent about $800 million worth of goods to Russia, including $300 million in machinery and $80 million in electronics. So what more can we do or should we be doing 
uh, to send countries a message that if you violate the sanctions, there are consequences. Because the sanctions are only as good as their enforcement at the end of the day. I've been the architect of many of them. But without enforcement, they are, they are meaningless. So Mr. Singh or Mr. Lowry, what, can you talk to the China question? What, why is it that we don't seem to sanction China when they are getting millions of barrels? I mean, this is not like you know a super state secret. The world knows that they're doing this, yet we don't seem to sanction them. Is there some impediment? Um, so I will, I'll try to start. Um, and uh, the so it is correct that uh, China, India, Turkey have been a diversification strategy for Russian oil exports, um, uh, and and probably uh, and other exports and imports. Um, the issue will be is that China and India, particularly, never signed on to the sanctions regime in the first place, and so. Um, this is kind of the point about like uh, Mr. Singh and his team and the people at the Biden administration worked very hard on building out a coalition and it was really difficult. Um, but you, they, it wasn't perfect. And so you didn't get some, some economies to, to join in. And so the question then is how do you then do it now? Um, and it's hard to actually come up with mechanisms that don't create other consequences that are problematic. And, um, and so that kind of leads you towards you know, greater diplomacy and working with countries that are slightly more adversarial towards us and someone that are actually slightly more friendly to us, but they are countries that we have we used deal secondary with. sanctions before. Mr. Singh, we've used yeah, secondary I'm, I'm happy sanctions to. before. We don't have to necessarily say, if you don't sign on, you get a free pass, because then you know a lot of the world wouldn't sign on, right? They can get the free pass without consequence. So, Senator, I mean, I'll, I'll pick up on, on Mr. Lowry's comments. Unlike cutting-edge technology or foreign capital, uh, in energy, we don't have an asymmetric advantage because of Russia's status as the world's second largest producer of oil and third largest producer of natural gas. And so we had to take a different approach, which was to say, how can we minimize his energy export revenues while maintaining a steady supply of global energy so we don't hit Americans at the pump, right? And so our, our first effort in this regard was, well, let's Selling shut down. China doesn't hit us at the pump. So, so if, if Russia exports none of its oil to global markets and we don't have a replacement, the concern would be without OPEC plus or domestic producers filling the gap, we would see a spike in prices that would cause even more of an inflation problem than we were experiencing last year. And so what we've done with China, India, and Turkey is said, receive the gift of our bargaining power, ride the coattails of this cap, and insist to Russia that you pay no more than the $60 a barrel that we've set. And of course, we can reduce that cap to 50, 40, 30, down to the marginal cost of production for Russia. And that's the way in which we can gradually tighten the vice grip on Putin's energy export revenues without hurting Americans uh, in terms of the, um, the cost of energy, the cost of food. Well, according to the administration's own words, where they say that China is considering the possibility of sending arms to Russia, that hasn't worked out too well. Yeah. Uh, you know, it hasn't worked out too well. They're considering selling arms to Russia, which dramatically changes the nature of this conflict uh, if they were to do so. So in my mind, uh, either you are in a fight to win or you're in a fight to delay a long period of time. Let me, one last question. Uh, as um, chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, uh, I have an increasing view that the United States has to lead the creation of an economic alliance among like-minded countries that can provide a framework for cooperative action in response to military aggression violations of sovereignty, economic coercion, and retaliation by adversaries. And Mr. Singh is the coordinator of the international economic response to Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Do you believe that something like this, an economic NATO, so to speak, is something that could be done? I think it's a fantastic idea uh, to look at where our collective strengths intersect with the target's vulnerabilities and to move together, because otherwise uh, we will be perceived as deploying the unilateral exercise of American financial force. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the shared defense of core principles that underpin peace and security. So I think your idea is very much on point. Thank you. I understand the chairman asked me to recognize Senator Rounds. Yeah, Senator Rounds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
Gentlemen, first of all, thank you for coming before the committee today. We do appreciate it. As you know, there have been numerous reports of suspicious activity by U.S. adversaries in regards to U.S. agricultural land purchases. In 2020, a Chinese-linked company planned to build a wind energy farm project near Del Rio, Texas, only miles away from Laughlin Air Force Base, where U.S. pilots are trained. And in 2022, a CCP-linked company attempted to build a corn milling plant on farmland near a sensitive Air Force base outside of Grand Forks, North Dakota. Uh, my question to Mr. Singh to begin with, in, in your experience as a former Deputy National Security Advisor for International Economics, how might foreign investment in U.S. ag land and companies by adversarial nations, uh, particularly China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran, how could that impact our national security, especially if in close proximity to military installations? Well, thank you, Senator. Food security is economic security. Food security is national security. I think it's as simple as that. The supply chain for food in this country has to be uh, taken, w treated with the utmost importance in the same way that we do with foundational technologies in the same way that we do with energy and manufactured goods. Uh, you've added an additional layer of concern, which is that if the land that is uh, built or in a greenfield investment is used for the purpose of spying, that, that raises an additional level of concern. And so CFIUS has the capacity to uh, require notification for the acquisition of land above a certain threshold. It can bring in the experts to determine whether a national security risk is implicated. And uh, that strikes me as a reasonable way forward. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Lowry, I have, I, we have uh, bipartisan legislation. In fact, Senator Tester and I have it together. It's called the PASS Act, and that would prohibit China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea from purchasing U.S. ag land and agricultural companies, as well as uh, adding the Secretary of Ag as uh, a standing member of the Committee on Foreign uh, Investment in the United States, CFIUS. The agricultural industry is, in my opinion, a significant part of not just my home state's economy, but nationally, and making it a true potential target for foreign investment, particularly when you add in the geographic uh, specifics that we've identified in the last two specific issues. How might legislation like the PASS Act help protect this very important sector, particularly in these geographic locations? Um, thank you, Senator. I, um, I I don't know the specifics of your legislation, but from what you just described, I think that the issue to think about is a, is a couple fold. One is, as Mr. Singh kind of alluded to, um, CFIUS does have the ability under FIRMA, the, the law that was passed to reform CFIUS back in 2018 and the regulations in 2020, to look at uh, greenfield investments in agricultural spots that provide a national security nexus. So. Um, uh, in terms of a few things, one is if the Department of Agriculture should be part of CFIUS, that's something I think that's a very reasonable idea. Right now, if there is an agricultural aspect to a transaction, agriculture can be brought in by CFIUS, um, and it has been in the past. But that doesn't mean it shouldn't be more of a regular operation as opposed to kind of an ad hoc type of thing. In terms of a prohibition on specific countries and investments, um, I would have to really look at I I have my concerns about that because I do believe strongly in the ability for countries to, uh, and entities to invest in the United States because I think that is, that is actually a positive for the United States. So I would be, I'm a little reluctant on suggesting uh, outward absolute prohibitions but I think that, you know, um, without seeing the legislation, I think that, that that would be my caution, I guess. Th thank you. And I, the reason why I ask is because the prohibition was specific to those associated with, with uh, China um, uh, and North Korea, uh, Russia in, in particular right now, and I think that's a, a huge part of it, and Iran. And particularly because I can't imagine why we would, any of us would want them to be able to purchase farmland in particular, particularly if it was an area that was near a sensitive geographic location. And uh, it surprised us that those particular two areas that I had identified earlier had actually gone as far as they did before they were, were stopped. 
So I, I appreciate that and, and thank you for your comments. Thank you, Mr. Thanks, Chairman. Senator, Senator Tester from Montana is recognized. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, ranking member. Congratulations to the ranking member uh, for uh, taking over this committee. It's the first time I've been here in person. I've been online, so thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Ms. Tester. I'll extend to you another 30 seconds, please. Oh, perfect. Continue. Yeah, keep, <laughs> keep going. That, that's perfect. Uh, so it, Senator Rounds brought up an issue that's near and dear to my heart because we have a bill on it, so it ain't over with yet, folks. Uh, I want to talk to you more about China, North Korea, Russia, Iran uh, being prohibited from buying land. Um, number one, let's just take it at that face value. Do we have the ability to be able to track and stop that sale from happening on farmland or an agribusiness? Because it applies to both. Um, right now, my understanding of the laws or rules for CFIUS is that if a transaction was in a greenfield transaction and is within a certain uh, uh, mileage, basically, of sensitive areas, okay. then uh, CFIUS can investigate that transaction and make a determination on whether or not it is a national security and, issue and eventually, potentially, even block it. Okay, so uh, and so the definition of a sensitive area becomes... Pretty damn important. I would suggest yes. Mm -hmm. And do you have any idea what the mileage is on that? So I think that um, the CFIUS has put together regulations and they have created an annex. And that annex actually says which are the sensitive sites. Uh, I got you. Like an ICBM missile silo would be a sensitive site. That seems like it would be. And yes. the question mm -hmm. is, is, does that extend 500 miles, 50 miles, 5 miles? Um, I can't I didn't, I can't remember off the top of my head, and I apologize. That, that's, that's important to know. And this, by the way, would not only ban that, it would ban, ban it all. Because quite frankly, I'm going to tell you, and I don't want to speak for Senator Rounds, I don't think China, North Korea, Russia, or Iran gives a damn whether we exist or not. So why should we allow them entrance, any entrance, into our country? Because if you take a look at those countries, they're all affiliated. If a Chinese company comes in there, they're affiliated with the Chinese Communist Party. So the question becomes, we can have the debate, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Rounds and I already have our minds made up. This is a good thing to have happen yeah. for, for not only America's national security, but for our food security, which is, you had already pointed out, are, are one and the same. The, the question becomes is, if we put it into effect, can, can you give us the ability so we can actually enforce it? So we could actually enforce it, number one. Number two, is it even possible to do this, assuming they're not going to come in as an oligarch from Russia, but use a shell company that may be a Canadian company? So um, purchases, uh, I mean, right now, yeah, under CFIUS, um, CFIUS has become expansive in the last few years. And instead of de dealing with 100 or so transactions a year, it's now dealing with over 400. Okay? So that means... You have to have resources. You have to be able to look. These are national security issues that people are looking at. If you expand to the whole of the United States and basically say every single purchase of any type of land by anybody from China, whether they're from a private sector or a government sector or from Russia, by or the way, unless you can going prove to, to be, be different, a fair amount of if, work. If if you can prove to be different, private sector is government sector in China. That's fine. Uh, but the thing is, is that um, what we have to think about is, in some respects. How big is the issue or the problem at this point? Is, is there a lot of ownership? Um, and I think the answer is probably no. And, um, but then if you are going to take and look at every single transaction that takes place on farmland from yes. foreign, foreign buyers, because if you're concerned about shell companies, yes. that could be a fairly significant expansion of CFIUS. Yeah, it, it, uh, I, think, I think it would be. And I think uh, the challenge is, is, do we think this is real or do we not think this is real? And, and one of our challenges is we, and this is the scary part, we don't know how big of an issue it is. We don't know how big of an issue it is. I can tell you, I had a farm bill listing session. Montana's a pretty good sized state. It's 540 miles long, long and 400 miles wide. I haven't had one yet where this issue hasn't either been brought up in public or in private. So there's land transferring all over the place here. And I think we need to get our hands on it. I think, you know, the balloon should have been a wake up call for us all. It really should have been. Because the truth is, is if, if they own land where I live, which is as the crow flies, probably 60 miles from the nearest silo. 
um, I would say that it, that's of concern for me. So what the hell? I mean, there's, tech, there's, there's sensitive sites all over the country. Here's what I hope, guys, and then I'm going to turn it back to the chairman. I hope you'll work with us to make this workable. And I know it's going to be complicated, and I know that people are going to say this can't be done, but I think this is a huge issue. I think it's a huge national security issue, and I don't think we should be allowing countries who don't give a damn whether we exist or not owning land, whether it's farmland or agribusiness in this country. They're not our friends. They're not here to do us good things. Okay? Thank you all very much. Uh, thanks, sir, Tester, and, and thank you, too, for your outspokenness for years, maybe for decades, about uh, Chinese coming up, Chinese coming and buying up American farmland. I know that's especially important because how you make your living, your other living. So thank you. Um, Senator Kennedy is recognized from Louisiana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to talk just for a second about sanctions with respect to, uh, to Russia, which I support. I think most of us do. Only a third of the world's population lives in countries that have both condemned Russia's invasion of Ukraine and have agreed to join in to the sanctions imposed by the United States and the West. Mr. Singh, do doesn't the Biden administration need to do a better job of, of, of getting uh, our world's neighbors on board? Senator, thank you. I, as a self-critique, I, I, I wish we had a broader coalition, but I wouldn't want to make the mistake of conflating population with power. Uh, these sanctions work where we have an asymmetric advantage. The world's major reserve currency issuers, with the exception of China, are all part of this sanctioned regime. So we collectively deny foreign capital to Russia. That's what matters. We collectively have the world's major designers and producers of cutting edge technology within the sanctions regime. It may not represent the majority of the world's population, but it's, it's the group that matters. So we're you, delivering impact. Let me stop you for a moment, and I apologize. No problem. The time goes by so quickly. Why can't the Biden administration convince India to help us? We're trying. I tried. We, I went there, and, and we've had a steady stream of officials go to India and try to work with the deal space that we have. I think we've got quite a bit of, uh, we've got quite a bit of leverage because of the relationship that we're building across trade, energy, infrastructure, finance, defense. I think we got to play the long game with countries that have historically tried to carve out a non-aligned stance and want to hedge their bets somewhat. Well, and, but in the, in the, I understand the long game game, and and I know sanctions take time, but uh, in the long term here, Putin could win. Um, a, as you know. Europe and the United States have designed a set of sanctions and export controls to basically try to cap uh, the, the, the price of Russia's oil at 60 bucks. Yes. Now, we, we, don't, we both know that's not terribly punitive because China and India are paying a whole lot less than 60 bucks a, a barrel to China. In part because of the cap, Senator. And you mentioned, I mean, if we really want to cut off Putin's cash flow, why don't we set that cap at the marginal cost of production for Russia? Yeah. We can follow can. up on what Senator Menendez said. Now you've done something. Why don't you do that? I think we can get there. Well, we what are we there. waiting on? Well, first you got to build a coalition. You got to get enough countries to have a coalition that has bargaining power that can actually influence the global price of oil because that's what we pay. And now we've got a 37 or so country coalition that's influencing the price that Russia can sell its but, oil to. Not only to us, but we're not I, importing I, any. I get it. I, I understand it, and I understand the politics of it. You've got to worry about the price of gasoline too. Yeah. In America, I get all that. But what are we waiting on? I mean, well, look, the longer I, I, we I, wait, he, he, here's, 
I, I think it's becoming clearer and clearer that that Putin has misjudged the people of Ukraine. Yes. And it's becoming clearer and clearer that President Xi has misjudged President Putin. He believed him that he could roll into Kiev like, like thunder on a summer night. Now, you say on the one hand, that's good. On the other hand, that, that makes both Xi and Putin desperate, which I think is why, why uh, Xi is talking about sending arms mm. to Putin. Why, why don't, I understand the politics of it, but why don't we just go to our friends in Europe and say, look, we're going to either win this thing or not. Now, this $60 cap on oil, we both know that's not having a serious effect. It's having some effect. I don't mean to criticize your work. But if you really w want to strangle them, reduce that cap down to the marginal cost for pr of production for Russia, and you cut off their cash flow. Senator, I think two things can be true. We are having an effect. His oil and gas revenues are down almost 50% year over year. But you're right that we can do more. For Let's example, do it. why aren't we doing it? Well, I'm no longer in the administration. Maybe we are working on it. Yeah, that. but you got friends there. Sure. <laughs> Maybe we are. I mean, I, I don't mean to just dumb and pick on you. Well, no, but I, you're a very smart guy, and I've learned a lot listening to you. Gentlemen, do y'all have any thoughts on that? Uh, I think you make very fair points. I. Uh, Dilip's point is a very good one, which is it's just hard sometimes to build a coalition. If you saw the argumentation within the EU over the $60 price cap was a, as far as I can tell from an out, as outsider's view, a knockdown drag out fight within the EU. And so, because um, I think there were countries like Poland uh, who wanted a much lower cap, uh, but then there were other countries who wanted a higher cap. Well, and, and excuse me for interrupting, but yeah. I'm, I'm about out of time. Let's just face reality, okay? Um, Europe, if we've learned nothing from this, we've learned that Europe is totally dependent on the United States of America for its security, period. And if were it not for the United States of America, Putin would be in Paris right now. I think we need to get a little tougher and firmer on our friends in Europe. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your indulgence. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. Uh, Senator Warner is recognized uh, from his office. From um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate you holding this hearing. I think it's critically important. Many of my colleagues' uh, questions I agree with. I want to take it in a slightly different direction, and particularly from my role as chairman of the Intelligence Committee. I think I want to talk about how we can limit foreign technology. Uh, in, in the United States, because I do think the technology competition, particularly with China over the next balance of this century, is, um, is going to be where our futures are going to be decided. And my feeling right now is we have taken kind of a whack-a-mole approach uh, to this issue. We, a number of years back on the Intel Committee, we identified the problem with the Russian software company Kaspersky. We dealt with that. We, we identified the challenges with Huawei, and we've spent public monies um, to kind of rip and replace. Uh, we've seen an activity uh, using the um, Secretary of Commerce's tools to go after some of the uh, chip companies in China on the entities list. And now many of us are concerned about the notion of, of um, communication firms like TikTok and both the potential of taking American data or being a, a massively used propaganda tool for um, the Communist Party of China. So, Mr. Wolf, I'd, I'd like, I know this is an area of your expertise, you know, where do we have limitations? And as we think about restraints on um, federal tech or, or foreign technologies, wouldn't it be better to have a broad, holistic approach uh, that could take on any of these technology challenges? Could you address this? Sure, thank you, happy to help. Um, so what you're referring to are the information communication technology supply chain regulations that were published in final form uh, at the end of the Trump administration and the current Commerce Department has uh, continued and has given responsibility to my former bureau, the Bureau of Industry and Security. And I think your bill or others in order to give congressional voice and authority and mandate and resources 
uh, to implementing that is really quite critical. Right now, the authority is under the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, and it would be, in my view, best that Congress uh, speak directly and clearly as to it. Uh, the, the authority uh, closes a gap. Uh, addresses a gap between export controls, which is outbound focused, uh, CFIUS, which is inbound when there is an investment, and what you're referring to is to the extent that there are transactions or activities involving the communication supply stream. Um, it's still really in its earliest stages of creating a whole new bureau and activity and policy and regulations. The key difficulty is how you scope it, because the number of transactions that would be affected as drafted are in the millions and trying to create a licensing structure or a CFIUS-like safe harbor approach would require the creation of a whole new department. And uh, there's also the general issue of ensuring that um, uh, any type of regulatory authority, if the discretion is so broad uh, that it will create perpetual clouds over uh, the use and acquisition of electronics and other information equipment in the United States. So the, the principle and the policy are terrific. It closes the gap. Congress should speak but it's about resources, scoping, and a clear mandate, particularly, by the way, with respect to protecting personal data, which for which there isn't uh, a clear regulatory structure and export controls and CFIUS and sanctions uh, really don't have the tools to do that. So I think it's a long well, way let me, let me just, order. I, I appreciate this and I, I appreciate uh, I've obviously been working on a bipartisan approach that I will hopefully roll out shortly, but you know, in some of this terminology from my colleagues, IEPA is a, a bill that goes back to the 60s, broadly gives the president some authorities, um, but it has been modified by the so-called Berman Amendments in the, the late 80s, which particularly around communication uh, technologies put some limits on, on uh, IEPA. Um, Mr. Trump's ICTS um, executive order, uh, again, has some challenges because it falls under this IEPA slash Berman framework, uh, I think, to get at an entity like TikTok or other communication entities where there may be a higher standard, uh, where we don't have the kind of uh, traditional entity list designation, or even we've seen like with the FCC, when they went after Huawei, that's a single entity, but it's not a comprehensive interagency approach. So, uh, Mr. Wolf, um, I know we're down to the last 30 seconds. Do you have any other, I just wanted to, from my college, point out our current structure just doesn't, in a holistic way, particularly take on these technologies that are in the communication space. And I have grave concerns with the level of investment that China is making, uh, that the challenge of who will be successful will be who controls communication technologies, who controls satellites, who controls artificial intelligence, quantum computing. And I don't believe, unless we continue with the current whack-a-mole approach, that we've got the tools at hand. And I hope to work with the, all my colleagues on how we might more comprehensively address this. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Warren. Warner. Uh, Senator Vance of Ohio is recognized. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and uh, Mr. Singh, I want to direct my questions to you. I just want to ask about the, the Russian sanctions in particular, whether they've been effective or ineffective. And I want to just, as a backdrop here, offer a few, uh, a few pieces of, of information. So last March, a month into the war in Ukraine, President Biden went to the Royal Castle in Warsaw and unveiled a sanction re regime that he said represented a, quote, new kind of economic statecraft with the power to inflict damage that rivals military might. Um, I certainly hope he was wrong, because if he wasn't, then I'm a bit more worried about our military might than I was before I just read this quote. Because, look, the, the, the issue here is that the sanctions, if you look at the numbers, have clearly not matched up with what the Biden administration predicted. So a couple of pieces of information. Biden swore that the Russian economy would be, quote, cut in half. The White House predicted that last year the Russian economy would shrink by 15 percent or more. In fact, it shrank just 2.2 percent. Uh, Biden, I believe, said that the Russian ruble would be reduced to rubble. In fact, the Russian ruble is one of the best performing international currencies in the world today and is worth, uh, uh, compared to our dollar, is worth the same that it was when the invasion began uh, a little over a year ago. Um, you know, you were the architect of these sanctions, and so I'd like to better understand the approach that you advised President Biden to take. But first, I, I would like your candid assessment. Do you think that these sanctions have been effective? Thank you, Senator. I think sanctions are doing their job. They're not the only tool we're deploying. The most important ones are helping Ukraine fight for its freedom, enlarging and fortifying NATO's eastern flank, helping the world get off of Russian energy, welcoming the millions of refugees flowing into Europe, uh, and, and, you know, these are, the, these are the tools that in tandem can make a difference. But when it comes to sanctions, yes, I think they're doing their job. 
you are correct, sir, that the decline in Russia's GDP, 2.2% last year, is lower than what many expected, including me. But as I, as I mentioned uh, previously, I think what Putin has done is created a Potemkin facade. He has propped up this year's growth by sacrificing his long-term growth potential. How? Capital controls. If you have a ruble in Russia, it's very difficult to convert that to a dollar. If you can't access dollars, you can't import anything. Without imports, Russia can't modernize or diversify its economy. Russia weaponized energy. That, of course, pushed up energy prices. That flattered net exports. That flattered GDP growth. But he's lost half of his energy customers. And oil and gas revenues are down 50% year over year. And then the last thing he did is he spiked government spending by 60%. Um, you can do that to prop up GDP growth, but you'll deplete national savings. You'll drive up inflation. You'll drive up interest rates. We've degraded his military industrial complex. We've cut off Russia from its, its major energy, energy consumer in, in, in Europe. So, Mr. Uh, I, I want to just unpack a couple of points there. So, so certainly take the point that perhaps the Russian long-term economic damage has been there. Uh, but it's a little concerning for us as policymakers when the administration says that these sanctions are going to be effectively a, a military-grade deployment into the Russian economy. And then you look at the top line data, and that just hasn't been borne out. Uh, and, I, and I worry about that. I also worry, I, I spoke to an international relations scholar yesterday who, who really expressed some concern about whether America's deployment of sanctions in this particular context and the failure to see obvious short-term benefit to the Americans, uh, obvious short-term damage, or at least nearly as significant as short-term damage to the Russians, uh, actually causes some credibility issues with our with our own government. Um, wh wh just a couple of, of other questions here. So I, I wonder when you guys were thinking about designing these sanctions, if you may be underweighted and under, um, understated the importance of manufacturing, mining, the sort of real sectors of the economy that are much more important when you're developing a war economy than, let's say, uh, finance or technology, um, or at least digital technology. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of curious there, sort of how you think about that, because you mentioned the Russian industrial base being degraded. Uh, but when I look at the Russians, you know, having a six to one artillery advantage against the Ukrainians and being able to, as apparently as far as the eye can see, de develop artillery munitions in a way where already America's stocks are being depleted. Uh, it looks in, 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 on, on the ground as if the Russians continue to have not just an artillery advantage today, but will plausibly have an artillery advantage six months in the future. Um, did you guys underweight the importance of manufacturing, mining, um, the, the sort of the, 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 the older economy, uh, according to a lot of people, but the economy that actually matters when you're fighting a war? Uh, thank you, Senator. It's a good question. Uh, you know, look, so we designed the sanctions to apply pressure where we have uh, a strength that intersects with Russia's vulnerability. So foreign capital was one of those areas. Cutting edge technology was a second. And yes, we have gotten into supply chains where we feel like we had collective leverage over Russia. But, you know, look, I think as it relates to the battlefield impact, uh, we'll never know because the intelligence on the ground in Russia is so sparse. But Every indication that I've, that I've seen is that he's running out of pre precision-guided munitions, running out of avionics, night vision goggles, satellites, tank production, car production. Uh, and he's having to rely on industrial goods like dishwashers and breast pumps to actually uh, function his, his equipment and his military. He's relying on North Korea and Iran to substitute for uh, the kind of technology you need to prosecute a war of this scale. Meanwhile, we're supplying the most sophisticated weaponry that we can uh, to Ukraine. So I think we're giving leverage to Ukraine on the battlefield. That's really where it matters most. Sanctions will never be a substitute for that kind of support. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Thanks Thank you. And I've been left with the chairman's gavel, so I recognize Senator Warren. Um, so um, ransomware has hit everywhere. In the past three months alone, Ransomware attacks have shut down four public schools in Nantucket, Massachusetts, affecting 1,700 students and their families. They've exposed the health records of over 3 million patients in California, and they have shuttered all four of Dole's food production plants in the United States, halting food shipments to grocery stores and disrupting our already vulnerable supply chain. That's just in the last three months. Let's do the last 24 hours. 
Just yesterday, we learned that ransomware attackers stole sensitive investigative information from the U.S. Marshals Service. Now, according to FinCEN, in the first half of 2021 alone, ransomware attackers likely received $5.2 billion, that's in half a year, in payments from American businesses, hospitals, school systems, and public utilities. Before 2016, the majority of cybercrime attacks involved small-scale credit fraud and bank fraud. Ransom payments ranged from about $75 to about $750. Today, the average ransomware attacker demands about $5 million. Now, Mr. Singh, you're an expert on international economics and national security. These large-scale attacks and large ransom payouts would they be possible without crypto? No, Senator. I think digital assets are central to the business model of ransomware. Okay. And in fact, do you know what proportion of ransomware attacks are paid off by crypto? Must be close to 100%. They're exactly right. Uh, right at 100%. The most active ransomware gangs are affiliated with or based in Russia, North Korea, and Iran. Now, Mr. Singh, does that put our national security at risk? Absolutely. So, thank you. In fact, in 2021, about three quarters of all ransomware revenues, that's now measured in billions and billions of dollars, three quarters of it went to Russia-linked ransomware gangs. In the years since Russia invaded Ukraine, Russian criminal organizations have doubled down on using crypto to hold American businesses, American schools, American hospitals hostage. Some have even declared allegiance to Vladimir Putin, vowing, quote, to strike back at critical infrastructures of Russia's enemies. And just last week, a Russia-affiliated ransomware gang called Black Cat attacked 13 hospitals in eastern Pennsylvania. So, Mr. Singh, I have one more question for you. You helped craft the sanctions that our country imposed on Russia and that you were just talking about with Senator Vance. You helped craft this in response to the Ukraine invasion. Is crypto allowing Russian ransomware gangs to extort American businesses and potentially evade those sanctions? Senator, I, I don't believe it's allowing for the evasion of sanctions at scale, but even a dollar of evasion is not something we ought to tolerate. And I, I think the, uh, as I reflect upon the experience, one of the, one of the efforts we made in parallel was to launch the executive order on digital asset regulation and also trying to push our government to launch a digital dollar, which I think is the single best step that we could take because it would crowd out the ecosystem of crypto that allows national security adversaries like Russia to exploit our deficiencies, our weaknesses in terms of our critical infrastructure. And yes, I think to some extent, we won't know exactly for sure uh, to evade the impact of our sanctions. So actually, let me just drill down just a little bit on this. In March 2022, FinCEN issued an advisory warning about Russian attempts to evade sanctions. The guidance said, and I'm going to quote, sanctioned persons, illicit actors, and their related networks or facilitators may attempt to use crypto and anonymizing tools to evade US sanctions and protect their assets around the globe." End quote. And in September 2021, OFAC issued an advisory highlighting the sanctions risks associated with ransomware payments. And if I'm not mistaken, you were serving in the White House at this time. Do you agree with these statements from FinCEN and OFAC? Yeah, I, I do. Good. You know, crypto is being used to hold American businesses for ransom. It's being used to threaten American towns. It's being used to evade American sanctions. And it's being used to enrich America's adversaries. We have got to stop helping these guys by letting crypto go unchecked. Senator Roger Marshall and I are introducing, reintroducing our crypto anti-money laundering bill to protect our nation from ransomware attacks by stopping the flow of dirty money. It's something we need to do for our national security. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman.
thank you, uh, Senator Warren. Uh, Senator, uh, Senator Haggerty from Tennessee is recognized. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and welcome to our guest today. Over the past year, we've seen the blatant disregard of a nation's sovereignty by Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine. And right here in the United States, we've seen an invasion of our own sovereignty as a CCP spy balloon was allowed to float over our nation for a number of days, including over sensitive military sites in my home state of Tennessee. In the case of Russia, I was pleased to see the administration apply sanctions to key Russian sectors, such as its finance and energy sectors, sectors which were used to fuel Russia's aggression in Ukraine. In contrast, China has simply received a slap on the wrist at best for its complete and illegal violation of our U.S. sovereignty. To date, only six, again, just six entities from China have been added to the Department of Commerce's inter in entity list, and zero sanctions have been applied to the PLA, to the state-owned enterprises, and to the other entities that supported developing this balloon and its payload. It's well known that China's space sector writ large is entirely administered by, or at least works in close coordination with the CCP's People Liberation Army. If that isn't damning enough, the administration was forced to sanction a Chinese space entity, Space City, for providing support to the Russian military. I'd note that if you just took a look at Space City's website, you'll see that they directly partner with China's nuclear weapons manufacturers, their defense universities, and the state-owned enterprises that directly support the PLA. So Mr. Singh, my first question is for you. Do you believe that the administration should be doing more to hold the People's Republic of China, to, to include its space sector, accountable for violating our sovereignty and our national security? And I appreciate a yes or no answer, please. Senator, I'll, I'll be concise. I mean, to the extent we have evidence of which entities were involved with the violation of our sovereignty, we have uh, any number of tools that we can consider deploying. Should we do more? I've not seen the forensics, but we certainly have the capacity. I think it's clear to the American public the warnings needed to be done. Mr. Singh, I'll stay with you on this. You're one of the chief architects of the economic sanctions imposed by the U.S. on Russia, as Senator Warren just highlighted. Under what conditions would you recommend that this administration consider sectoral sanctions against other adversaries like the People's Republic of China? Senator, so the, the conversation about what tools to use has to start with the strategy. What's the objective? So for any target, the question is, are we trying to deter an activity? Are we trying to impose maximal costs? Are we trying to degrade their ability to project power? Are we trying to create a demonstration effect? Once we've identified our objective and our strategy, then we get into a discussion about tools. And different tools take advantage of our strengths uh, than others. And we have to think about this in terms of a multiplayer repeated game. We have moves we can make, so do our adversaries. The kind of analysis that I think is needed is to simulate how a conflict scenario plays out. Mm -hmm. How do we use economic statecraft? How do we use our military, uh, our military channels? What kinds of diplomatic avenues are, are available? And it's looking at the totality of the options available to us that will, I think, guide, should guide, the way in which we approach targeting I, countries like, like Russia. I, I understand that. Uh, my interest is right now in the People's Republic of China, though. You've been aggressive with respect to Russia and the, the sanctions applied there. I certainly encourage you to take a damn hard look at what the PRC is doing, particularly after they violated our sovereignty as they have. Mr. Wolf, I want to turn to you. The question is, being that you're the only witness here today that's worked at BIS, do you think it's appropriate for this administration to allow U.S. technologies to be exported to China technologies that advance the People's Liberation Army's military modernization efforts, including its near space and its space programs? Uh, no, um, of course. Uh, there, there's been a comprehensive embargo on um, the export of such items to China for decades. And with respect to um, uh, otherwise commercial civil items, that's actually sort of at the essence of my testimony to increase the effectiveness of the concern you're describing. Uh, to get items that are made outside the U.S. without U.S. technology uh, subject to comparable controls for the same reasons. How would you suggest that BIS step it up and stop the flow of technology that's going to China right now? One, it's the regular investigation that's described to the mm -hmm. parties that you're referring to and using the entity list aggressively uh, once the evidence is identified of somebody providing support to what you've just described. And second, I think more importantly, since the U.S. doesn't have monopoly on the inputs that are needed for that activity, uh, is to continue working with the allies to share information, evidence, declassified intelligence, so that they understand and share the same threat 
and more importantly, have the legal authorities under their systems in order to be able to impose controls from their countries over their items. And that will dramatically enhance the effectiveness of the concern you rightly point out. Got it. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Van Hollen of Maryland is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you and the ranking member for holding this hearing. Thank you to all of our uh, witnesses. Um, Mr. Singh, you made the point earlier that we have a lot of uh, positive incentives uh, to offer countries in terms of our global interactions, uh, diplomacy, development, um, incentives for more economic investment by America's private sector, security assistance, uh, but that sanctions are an important tool. Uh, I think we all recognize that we have to put sanctions in context, that it's, a, it's one tool, but a very important tool, and I think all of you have made uh, those points. I would like to follow up on the issue of the price cap. I thought this was an innovative approach taken by uh, the Biden administration with our G7 partners. I, I want to applaud the Europeans for recognizing the importance of moving off of uh, Russian oil after too long of a dependence of many of those countries on, on Russian oil. Uh, and I did hear your test testimony, Mr. Singh, pointing out that the, um, the revenue, Russian revenue from uh, year over year has dropped 50% from the uh, export of crude oil. And of course, this was only put in place in December. So we haven't yet seen the reduction in oil revenues captured in Russia's overall GDP uh, figures. We'll have to see what impact that has um, uh, over the next year. And of course, they just put in place the refined uh, petroleum products. Uh, but as with all sanctions, there are people who are already fast at work uh, trying to evade them to sell, you know, uh, and obviously Russia has an interest in selling above the price cap. Can you talk about additional enforcement measures you might take? Uh, former Senator Toomey and I were looking at a number of secondary sanctions options. They have pluses and minuses. But we also know that there are efforts to circumvent uh, the price cap. Can you talk about additional measures we can take on the enforcement side? Yeah, thank you, Senator. So you're right. Russia absolutely has an incentive to sell oil above the cap, but its customers don't. So we've really given them the gift of bargaining power. We've said to them, look, uh, if you pay above $60 a barrel, you've got to find your own, your own oil service providers for shipping, for insurance, for trade finance. And that's quite costly. Now, what can we do if there is evasion? You know, look, I think over time, uh, we can find ways to uh, reduce the price at which the cap is set, uh, just to clamp down further on Russia's ability to sell at prices that flatter its, its budget revenues. Um, if, if, if lowering the cap doesn't work, and you still have a lot of evasion from countries that are importing from Russia, uh, you know, I think we have two options. Either A, we can offer a better price to those countries and allow them to meet their energy needs with domestic production or maybe from production in third countries. Um, the other option is to use quiet private diplomacy and say, look, if, if you are continuing to purchase oil at levels that benefit uh, Putin and uh, go against the goals of the cap, which are to minimize his revenues while keeping global energy supplies constant, um, we have options and we can use them. Now, I don't think we should threaten countries in public. I would, I would use that as a last defense, as a last resort. Um, and I don't think we're quite there yet. Well, I, I agree with you. We should be steadily reducing uh, the cap, uh, tightening the cap, uh, because I think there's still a long way to go uh, to get to that marginal cost of production for, for Russia. Uh, obviously, we want to bring along our our coalition uh, as part of that. Let me turn to China for a moment. Um, and Mr. Wolf, and then anybody else who wants to, to comment um, with respect to the Commerce Department uh, actions. I was a supporter of the actions that the Trump administration took with respect to Huawei, uh, putting them on the entities list. I think that did have an impact uh, on Huawei. And I really appreciate the Biden administration's effort to really broaden uh, the export control list uh, so it doesn't focus just on one company, uh, but deals with the exports of highly sensitive chips and semiconductors that can be used in China's military, um, and taking a very broad approach using our sort of long arm uh, power uh, based on origin and US IP to apply these restrictions to other countries. How effective uh, do you think that's been to date? What can we do to further um, 
uh, encourage uh, its enforcement? Um, and what, do you, what is your assessment of how we can use that model going forward? No, excellent uh, question. And I, I think to date it's been very effective because the Commerce Department used an all of the above strategy of controlling exports from the US, activities, controlling activities of US persons, controlling foreign made items that are made with US t uh, technology and software. Uh, and it's been extraordinarily effective. The main essence of my repaired remarks is to make such controls more effective and, more, and as importantly, uh, less counterproductive for U.S. industry to convince the allies uh, who also produce similar technologies and have people who can provide similar services to adopt in their systems the same types of prohibitions. Uh, so to level the playing field for U.S. industry and to deprive the end users in China that you're referring to of the items of concern. And your question is an evidence of this broader than classical uh, strategic export control concept that I referred to at the beginning of a new way of thinking that's needed, and the U.S. should take the lead in articulating with its close allies. So uh, it's been very effective, but there's a lot more to be done. And on the enforcement, it will be inherently difficult because you are dealing with essentially commercial items that are very small, that are foreign made, that are outside the United States that get incorporated into commercial items. And again, this is where an equal degree of coordination and alignment of allied export control enforcement authorities, which, tra which trail behind the uh, licensing and policy officials, is absolutely critical. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Senator Van Hollen. Uh, Senator Daines from Montana is recognized. Chairman, thank you. Thanks for being here today. Um, Earlier this month, Larry Summers, of course, former Secretary of Treasury under the Clinton administration, Director of Economic Policy there under Obama. By the way, it was, it was Larry Summers that we were quoting right here in this room two years ago when we were debating the $1.9 trillion purely partisan spending package where Larry Summers says that's going to cause inflation. We were raising the alarm bells then. Um, and so I listen when Larry Summers speaks. I listen because he was certainly a prophet of what happened after that uh, massive spending bill passed in this Senate uh, two years ago. But he was discussing Russia's seizing of German assets after World War II and the seizure of Iraqi assets to help rebuild Kuwait after the Gulf War. I, he was discussing with Bloomberg. And he said this, and I quote, I believe that if this sets a precedent that continues that countries that engage in naked cross-border aggression will lose their state assets. That's a precedent that I think is a very healthy precedent to set, end quote. And I agree with Larry Summers. Yesterday, I reintroduced legislation that would do just this and repurpose frozen Russian assets to help pay for US aid provided to Ukraine as a result of Russia's invasion and I look forward to working with my colleagues on advancing this and or related legislation to hold Russia accountable and make it pay for the war they started. Questions uh, for each of you. Uh, research shows that Russia's crude fetched an average of roughly $74 a barrel in the four weeks that followed a price cap of $60 per barrel. Please tell me, are you aware of any sanctions or enforcement mechanisms that have been put in place regarding the Russian oil price cap? And if so, what penalties have been collected? I'll start with you, Mr. Singh. Senator, I, I, I'll answer your question. I first want to say I agree with you. We need to look at all creative ways possible to make Russia pay its fair share for the re reconstruction of Ukraine, which is probably going to be in the hundreds of billions of dollars. And if that means using the central bank reserves that we have mobilized as collateral for Ukraine to issue debt, I think that's something we ought to pursue. As to your Let question- is, what, what are the odds of us prevailing actually collecting that? I mean, it's, it's well, ta ta talk is cheap, but uh, actions here- I agree. W one idea, Senator, would be to use the reserves that we have immobilized at the New York Fed that are in our possession, uh, transfer them to Ukraine, allow Ukraine to put up those assets as collateral to raise new money mm -hmm. in amounts that would far exceed our, our capacity to provide or that of our allies or the World Bank or the IMF for that matter. Th to me, that's a twist on the Brady plan that worked in the early 1980s, mm -hmm. and it should be reimagined for today's circumstances. Thank you. Mr. Lowry, thoughts? So on their price cap question, um, <clears throat> uh, 
Mr. Singh mentioned earlier, has there been evasion, so to speak? So in some respects, the answer is yes, and the answer is no. The answer the, on the no part is obviously not every country said, hey, we're going to go on with this uh, cap. Uh, it was a number of countries have said they would, are willing to do it, but there are a number of countries said they're not willing to do it. On the yes is the, will there be evasion? Absolutely, there will be. So how does the price cap work? The price cap works through an insurance mechanism, basically. And so um, there are other insurers out there that are not necessarily part of Europe. There are insurers that are going to be created that are not part of Europe. There are, there are ships that will be able to take their, uh, uh, their, their cargo to countries and be able to evade the sanctions. Now, at this point in time, most of the, uh, the Russia has been offering discounts anyway prior to uh, the price cap that kind of brought the uh, uh, price down below $60 a barrel on aggregate. That doesn't mean there aren't individual parts where they're not. Um, so at this point, there probably has been some sanctions evasion. I think most of that sanctions evasion is happening from those that are saying, we're not, gonna, we're not willing to put in place this price cap. And... Um, and has there been enforcement mechanisms? Um, it, the price cap is very, very new. It's only been in place for a couple months at, you know, on oil uh, shipments, not on uh, petroleum products, which has only been in place for a couple weeks. Um, so I think that the enforcement is a very important point. It's an important point for all of the sanctions conversation we've yeah, been having I, throughout this th conversation. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm out of time here. Yep, but uh, just, just two days ago, uh, Secretary Summers, in fact, was citing Bloomberg indicating that current economic sanctions were failing to provide a deterrent to Russia's aggression and seems to indicate that more aggressive limits or further measures may be needed. So I'm, I'm out of time. Thank, thank you, Senator Dane. Senator Britt of Alabama is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, gentlemen, for being with us today. Before we start talking about sanctions, I wanted to take a moment to talk about the Committee on Foreign Investments in the United States. In 2021, the U.S. Department of Agriculture noted that foreign investors now owned over 40 million acres of our farmland. This has occurred um, since 2015 at a tune of about 2.2 million acres a year. I've heard from many Alabamians as I've traveled across the state, and this is a concern for them, specifically the Chinese Communist Party and their willingness and their efforts and deliberate and intentional attempts to buy up fertile U.S. farmlands. I believe food security is national security. Food security is economic security. So I believe that one acre of our farmland owned by the Chinese Communist Party is one acre too many. Additionally, I think there's another layer of national security concerns that we're allowing China to buy up farmland near our military installations. It is completely and totally unacceptable. So my question, Mr. Lallery, for you um, as a former chair of CFIUS, when it comes to ensuring we have a strong agriculture voice uh, at the table when these decisions are being made, do you agree that it's reasonable that the Secretary of Agriculture should be involved as a member of CFIUS? I think it is totally reasonable, yes. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, if the department, if the CFIUS needed to bring in agriculture right now, they can do it on an ad hoc basis. But to the point that you've made and a number of senators have made, um, it sounds to me like this probably should be looked at in a more systematic way. Yes, we need a permanent uh, seat at the table because it is absolutely unacceptable. When you look, I believe, uh, probably say with great confidence that the Chinese Communist Party is not allowing the United States of America to buy up their farmland, particularly dear, near their military installations. So on that line of questioning, um, under CFIUS, it's almost always national security agreements um, they're issued instead of outright blocking foreign companies from acquiring U.S. companies or engaging in transactions um, that are assessed to have these national security implications. Um, you know, we issue these agreements first. Um, and my question to you is, is how does CFIUS enforce a national security agreement? And what are the consequences for failing to adhere to the terms of those agreements? So if you look at most of the numbers about um, CFIUS reviewed in 2021, which is the last year we have um, 275 transactions. Of those 275 transactions, about 10% of them, roughly 30 uh, transactions, had what you just described, mitigation agreements. So that means basically that the government had concerns about the transaction, and but they thought the transaction could go through, but they wanted to make sure that there, there are specific measures put in place 
to protect national security potentially in the future. Those national security agreements um, can last for a long time. They are implemented and negotiated by specific agencies that have the right type of expertise. So if it's a military type of issue, the Department of Defense will uh, mm -hmm. negotiate it. If, if it's something on information technology issues, most likely the Department of Justice or maybe Homeland Security will do it. They follow these um, agreements up through monitoring mechanisms, auditing mechanisms from third party auditors. Um, and if there are violations of the mitigation agreements, they do have the capability um, to, uh, one, obviously uh, step in and do something, including they could actually divest the, the, the transaction at way after the fact, or more likely they could do something like they could do a fine, they could do warnings to basically see, kind of make sure you get your house in order type of problem. Um, so that's kind of how it works. Um, and I, I think there's roughly about 200 mitigation agreements from past that are in effect. Every now and then some of them roll off because there may be somebody else who comes in and purchases it who's a domestic buyer. So. Okay, so question actually for each of you. During your time in government, uh, were there violations of these mitigation agreements? Just yes or no? Um, no, but there weren't the same enforcement authorities that were created after I left in 2018. Okay. So I can't properly answer. Okay. Um, there were violations that we noticed when I was there, um, just like uh, Kevin said, that um, I, some of this has become tougher over time, but they have been violation agreement of the agreements, and usually they were worked out through mechanisms of, they weren't egregious violations is probably the best way. There were violations or, and there are things that happen that are just mistakes, right? And so the parties usually would work that out with the agency that was in charge who would report it back to the overall CFIUS committee to make sure that everybody was aware. Okay. I don't recall, it, much like Mr. Lowry just said, I don't recall intentional egregious violations, but I, but I do believe mistakes were made that had to be corrected. Okay, thank you all for your time. Thanks, Senator Brett. Senator Kramer of North Dakota is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and Ranking Member for having this important hearing. Thank you all for your um, expertise and, and sharing it with us. Um, I am the one person at the end of the table who's just lived the long CFIUS nightmare in Grand Forks, North Dakota. And I cannot tell you how disappointing it was and quite frankly how consequential it was for CFIUS after not just the 45-day review but then another 20 days added to get further information, all of which sends signals, of course, that were missed by local leaders, unfortunately, but um, only to conclude clumsily non-jurisdiction over an agribusiness 12 miles from a ISR military base and a, a LEO, you know, low earth orbiting satellite ground station. Um, it, it was because the, the outcome of that was the completion of a sale that should never have taken place. Now, that sale should never have been begun by local leaders, and they should have, you know, listened to a lot of people, including me, prior to the Air Force finally correcting Cepheus's error and stating emphatically in in a letter, this poses a significant risk to the, the Grand Force Air Force Base. So. I'm with all of my colleagues who have said that the Secretary of Agriculture should be a permanent member of CFIUS. If, if food supply chain isn't critical supply chain, nothing is. Um, I, I, you know, food's so darn important, maybe should be a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, but we won't, we'll, that's another committee I'm on. Um, so anyway, we're deeply disappointed and I hope we can, and I think we do have strong bipartisan support for strengthening agriculture's role on CFIUS. That said, I want to actually talk about something else for, for a little bit, and that's the role of domestic energy production and export as a means to bringing global price down. I long for the day when the WTI is the, is the global index, and I think we should do that, and I think we can do that by flooding the market with American oil, for example, and gas, and, and selling it to our friends and frenemies alike um, that will bring down price for all of us. That said, one of the means that, I, that I'm interested in that I've been working on is a carbon border adjustment mechanism that recognizes the high price that, we, uh, that our 
carbon intensive companies already pay for a higher environmental standard as well as other high standards like labor and workplace uh, standards and and joining forces with our friends that have similar standards and instead of punishing ourselves punishing uh, and manipulating, hopefully, the behavior of the polluters, which just also happen to be our adversaries in most cases. Um, I, I favor a much simpler approach than a lot of others because I'm a simple guy and I can understand simple things. But I might just be interested um, in each of you. I'd start with you, Mr. Wolf, since you've sort of managed some of these tariffs. I call this a, a pollution, pollution tariff. Um, what, what your thoughts are on the possibility of, of some sort of a pollution tariff or a, a CBAM? Uh, that recognizes our high cost of production. Uh, apologies, it's not an issue I focused on or uh, thought yeah, about, so I'll okay. defer to my colleague. All right, Mr. Lowry. Um, I think it's an interesting issue. Um, uh, it does strike me that you're going to have to then start thinking about how to come up with a price for carbon. Mm -hmm. And that's been, a, as we all know, that's a it's a dicey issue. It's hard to do. And... Um, and we're not there yet. So in order to have some sort of a border adjustment mechanism, I think you're going to have to figure out how to find a price for carbon. What, what about what Europe has done to this point? I wish they would have, I wish we could have caught up or they, we could have done it in sync with each other. Um, uh, it, clearly, it, price of carbon sends up all kinds of red flags, especially in my energy producing oil, gas, coal powered state of North Dakota where, but, but this is again where I think, can we find something that doesn't punish our own clean producers, um, but changes behavior? And Mr. Singh, th thoughts on the sure. possibility? Senator, yeah, I think there are two approaches out there. One is, do you set the, the, the tariff by your cost of regulatory compliance? Mm. That, that tends to be the European approach. The one that I think has more appeal is, how much have you actually done to reduce your emissions as a country? That's what matters, right? right? And so depending on how much progress you've made in reducing what actually impacts the environment, that determines the degree to which you impose a border adjustment tax. So I think that that's a tool. I think you're right, Senator. This is a tool that we need to think about and refine. To my mind, the latter approach is the way forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Kramer. I, uh, before we adjourn, and uh, I just wanted to say that I thank Senator Britt for sitting through this whole hearing. It's, a, it's an unusual occurrence, and she really did ask incisive questions, and I'm guessing she learned a lot because these witnesses, all three of them, were so good. She already knows a lot, so she learned even more, so I wanted to call her out for that. Thanks to the witnesses for being here. Uh, senators who wish to submit questions for the record, those questions are due one week from today, March 7th. For the witnesses, you have 45 days to respond to any questions. Thank you. This was a particularly good hearing, and the responses of all three of you. Thank you. We're adjourned.